bet you didn't expect to actually see me. Well, here I am. Welcome, horror fans, cinephiles, and Jello enthusiasts. This is the King in Jello, and I'm Tanner Leeser. And uh, you know, I owe it. This is the 1960s recap. This video will be a recap for the places in the Jelly Tally, the final standings. I will uh, talk about some of my favorite actors, favorite writers, composers, directors from the 60s, only looking at the 60s, mind you. And then uh, I will give you my top 10 favorites for the 60s. Keep in mind, I may recognize that some movies are better for the genre as far as what what the fuck? I may recognize that some movies are better for the genre, but these are my personal top 10 favorites. So the first thing I want to talk about for the 1960s Giallo films were the subgenres, the sub subgenres, if you will, that I observed. The 1960s subgenres I observed are gothic giallo films, which might be kind of self-explanatory. Uh, gothic horror films were a big thing in the decades prior and in the 60s too, but I feel like they were kind of starting to wane a little bit. Um, this is where you get some of your ha uh, hammer horror films. You also get a lot of, I mean, German horror films are very gothic. So what, what you're going to see with gothic gothic films so gothic jello films will be castles um usually a lot of um long deep shadows there's usually always a lot of playing with the lights and the shadows um you'll see a lot of people walking around with candles and such there's other elements to it but me personally i'm not a big um gothic movie fan gothic horror fan not that i don't like it i just am not well versed in it so i'm not the best person to speak more on it of the, the one of the other subgenres is the sexy jello film which oh my god sexploitation movies coming up they were coming up at this time and censors were laxing a lot of directors were testing let's see how far i can push this sex stuff you can really tell which ones those are uh in the 60s honestly the nudity and sexual themes are more laxed than in the 70s and the 80s with Jello films. Um, but your sexy Jello movies are going to be kind of the Umberto Lenzi movies, really, as far as the 60s, like the big names. The next subgenre, I just call this the Le Diabolique esque movies. Pretty much most of the Jello films that Ernesto Gastaldi wrote were heavily inspired by Le Diabolique the French film. I don't know how much I've talked about it on the channel that that is publicly seen. I mentioned, I talk about this a good deal in the my viewings, which are on Patreon. I am not a big fan of movies doing the Le Diabolique thing. The, the reason for that is, there's a couple of reasons. The main one is Le Diabolique was the first movie of that type that I saw that I can think of. And I think that movie did it the best. I think there's a reason why that is that film was a classic. So to see other movies do it always kind of rubs me the wrong way. And I feel that mostly all of those movies never can stand up to that French film. They can do their best. They can do their own things. And there are a few movie Jello movies that do the Le Diabolique-esque type lean that I do like. But they're also kind of hard to rewatch. Like, again, you watch that original film, you can kind of see all the the moving parts in terms of the conspiracy. In some of the Jello films, it's they're just not as well written. It's they don't hold up as well on subsequent viewings. It's mostly that first viewing, trying to figure out what is happening, and that's kind of my take. Is I, I've always been more into the murder mystery type Jello films and some other ones, but these ones are really. And if you don't, if you're not really too familiar with what I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm setting up with being like Lady Abolique, um, 
the movies where you're following a protagonist and their sense of what is actually happening, what is real, is kind of wavering. Maybe they saw something and when they try to tell someone else, the other person doesn't see what they were trying to say and now that person is being gaslit. Um, a lot of the times the character is taking pills or something of that equivalent or they, they have a, a history in their family of family members kind of losing their mind and so they're wondering if maybe I'm just going crazy and none of the shit is really happening. Only so many movies can really pull it off well because I think every movie you're it's basically like no it's really happening it really is a conspiracy and so not many movies do it well where I actually think maybe this person is batshit crazy. The next subgenre for the 1960s I observed are what I call the naughty elites. I talk about this a little bit in the Forgotten Jello films um, in a previous episode. That whole, it was more late 60s, but it was all your characters are rich people and they all have kind of, they all have this warped sense of life of uh, what they should be doing. That It seems like they're all bored in life. Mostly it's like men cheating on their wives, women cheating on their husbands, there's deception, there's betrayals, there's greed. It's almost like elite people who are so out of touch with other things. Everything else is just mundane to them. And they have to try and find their own ways to have fun and find meaning. And uh, they have a very broken sense of what that meaning is. Some of the movies are really fun. Uh, next sub subgenre again are the Krimi Giallo films. Krimi films were very popular in this decade from Germany. A lot of these Giallo films at this time, and even going into the 70s, were co-productions with West Germany. And a lot of the times, those German producers either wanted Krimi elements, or they wanted the film to be advertised as a Krimi. And so some movies like Bird of the Crystal Plumage has some elements Mostly that movie was just a result of the producers wanting it to be advertised as a crewing film so it would get a wider exposure, more people, more asses in seats. For me, what makes a movie a crimi giallo? Again, I'm not a knowledgeable fan, I should say, of crimi films, even though I ought to be. Anyways, I'm not knowledgeable of the genre in terms of watching it and like what you can what you can glean from it like i i what i know about crimi is what i've researched what i've read which is not the same thing as really grasping it so the 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 crimi jello are going to be more dealing with seedy underbellies of society uh the protagonist is either venturing into that area of society they are very much unfamiliar with the setting they are entering sometimes the protagonist has a criminal back uh, backstory sometimes they're um, just morally gray characters usually you're dealing with elements of crime you're dealing with elements of yes the next subgenre this one i kind of threw in last minute to kind of cover some other ones that maybe aren't really well defined in the previous subgenres I've already set out, and that's Hitchcockian Giallo films. Uh, these are basically movies that are just kind of following a plot that feels like it could be a Hitchcock movie. It feels like they're inspired by Hitchcock, and Hitchcock is one of the major influences on the film genre. So. Other than that, I, as I said, I kind of just threw that in there last minute. I'm not going to go off on a whole tangent on it. Um, this is one that I could have just omitted, but there it is. Uh, one that I don't have in here, but I'm thinking about it, are the Poliziateschi Giallo films. Those are more of a, I guess they are more, uh, starting in late 60s, but you do see more of those in the 70s. Those are where you are following it's similar to uh, the Krimi Jellos, but these ones are, you're like definitely following a cop. Usually you're uh, usually following a cop um, trying to solve the murder. Usually they are murders, naked violence. It's available in a box set of Fernando de Leo that are all Poliziateschi. So obviously that movie is seen as Poliziateschi for those genre fans. The Suspicious Death of a Minor by Sergio Martino. That is a Poliziateschi Jello although that is later, so I can't re really talk about that right now. Anyways, yeah, 
last one, and this is the definite subgenre for giallo films in general, and the 60s are the psychological thriller giallo films. This kind of bleeds over into the Lady Diabolique esque ones, uh, sometimes gothic. This one you'll get bleed over. It's the same kind of deal that I mentioned in the Lady Diabolique esque, where the character is usually thinking they're going insane. Um, I guess the main difference, I think the Lady Diabolique branding I give it is more for if people are setting up this conspiracy, trying to either get this person to get institutionalized to kill themselves or to somehow take their inheritance, take their fortune. Uh, psychological thriller Jello, you'll get that too, but I'd say it's less grand. Le the the stakes. Uh, the, sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's literally just someone going crazy. There's a lot. Of, as I've said, they cross over a lot. They overlap a lot. Anyways, let's move on. So I wanted to talk about the A to Z cliches that I have been doing for the Jelly Tallies. <laughs> so I went back to all my notes. I have some information here on the A to Z tallies. I hope this is interesting. The lowest score for the A to Z cliches was 12 out of 26, and it was the telephone. I don't really have a whole lot to say on that. It's uh, the short is like 23 minutes, and I say in the viewing for it that hell if this movie was an hour and a half it probably would have like been the top dog in terms of cliche points it it was doing everything right in that short amount of time the highest score for the a to z cliches for the 1960s received 19 out of 26 and it was so sweet so perverse i that that surprised me the mean score for this, the average, if you will, across all the movies was about 15.7. So round that up was about 16 AZ cliches observed. The most common, the most common AZ cliches that were observed. I basically always give the movie F is for fashion as long as there is something to justify it. Uh, usually it's just the way someone is dressed. And in these movies, people are dressed pretty damn nice. So, of course, that one's going to be in there. It's basically a given. There's a few of these that are givens, but the fact that some of these other ones are in there is pretty cool. F is for fashion. E is for eyeballs. L is for lies. Q is for questions. S is for secrets. T is for telephone. And Z is for Zoom. Those cliches were seen in all 10 films I talked about for the 1960s. The least common A to Z cliches observed were C is for children, J is for J and B, and X is for xenophobia were all only observed in two films. B is for blind was only observed in one film. And the one A Z cliche that was not observed in any of the films, D is for dwarves. Give it some time, you'll start seeing them all over. Okay, so now talking about the final standings for the Gialli Tally. I'll say this, the average Gialli Tally score across the 10 movies was 425.4 points, or 425 points. So these are the top 10 Gialli Tally movies. I will go from the one that was in last place all the way up to the one that was in first. So obviously in 10th is The Telephone. 1963. It had 12 out of 26 A to Z and 254 points total. The next one, number nine, The Possessed, 1965. 16 out of 26 A Z cliches observed, 328 points total. Number eight, Death Laid an Egg, 1968. 17 out of 26 A Z cliches, 372 points total. Number seven, Libido, 1965, 15 out of the 26 A to Z cliches, 407 points total. Number six, Blood and Black Lace, 1964, 13 out of 26 A to Z cliches, 422 points total. Number five, 
so sweet, so perverse. 1969. 19 out of 26 A to Z cliches, 425 points total. Number four, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, 1963. 18 out of 26 A to Z cliches, 452 points total. Number three, Orgasmo, 1969. 15 out of 26 AZ cliches, 484 points total. Number two, Double Face, 1969. 15 out of 26 AZ cliches, 539 points total. And number one for the Jelly Tally scores was Perversion Story, 1969. 17 out of 26 AZ cliches, 571 points total. Real quick, I'm going to talk about some of my favorite actors and my overall favorite performances. Jean Sorel, Jean-Louis Trintignant, Klaus Kinski, and Dante Di Paolo. My favorite male performances were Klaus Kinski in Double Face, and above that, I rank Peter Baldwin in The Possessed. My favorite female actors in the 1960s were Ava Allen, Elsa Martinelli, Colette Decombe, and Leticia Roman. My favorite female performance is, hands down, Leticia Roman in The Girl Who Knew Too Much. My favorite director for the 1960s overall is Mario Bava. I think this one kind of has to be Bava because, I mean, this is going to sound kind of like cliched, I guess, but he made the first of these films. Now, if I just said because that, that would be a weak reason. The Girl Who Knew Too Much is actually a damn good movie. I mean, it's it's kind of corny, but for a Jello, it's, I think it's good. Blood and Black Lace was then also probably one of the most important Jello films of this era. And also the telephone short is like, for me, I think that short is so goddamn good. That's, that's my opinion. I think there really are no other contestants against Bava in the 60s, except Umberto Lenzi and I'm not as big a Lindsay fan as I am Bava. So for me, it is Bava is the king of the 60s. My favorite writer for the 1960s Giallo films, Ernesto Gastaldi, Giulio Chesti, and Lucio Fulci. Ernesto Gastaldi wrote the most scripts and they're all competent and good scripts. Giulio Chesti wrote Death Laid an Egg and The Possessed, uh, or at least he partially wrote those movies. So I give him a lot of credit. Those movies, I think, are some of the most original in Giallo in, in general. And then Lucio Fulci. I got to say, Perversion Story is probably the best script of the 60s. Um, not saying that's my favorite movie. You'll find that You'll find that out soon enough. But I do think overall that script is probably the most competent and well-composed. My favorite script, I really like The Telephone. If you watch my viewing for it, I mentioned that it reads like a script I would have written if I was trying to put a giallo up on the stage. <laughs> it's totally something I would have written. I'll admit I wouldn't have written something as great, but it would definitely be in that vein. But the overall best script, in my opinion, in the 60s is Perversion Story. My favorite music for the 1960s. My favorite composer for the 60s is Ritz Ortolani. Again, there's not really um, there's not really much competition. My favorite score, though, it's kind of a toss-up between two movies, Libido and The Possessed. Likewise, my favorite piece of music is from Libido. and from The Possessed. Okay, my favorite scene in the 1960s is between two movies. This scene from Blood and Black Lace. and this scene from Libido.
my favorite ending or reveal is three movies, but uh, third place is The Telephone. Second is Orgasmo. Il merito di questi brillanti risultati è del tenente Arthur Frank, del nucleo investigativo del district attorney di New York. And first is Perversion Story. This is Donald Grant coming to you from San Quentin Prison. I'm actually in the gas chamber of the prison. Monica. When this telephone rang and Dr. George du Maurier was freed. My favorite kill is between two movies. Second, I'll say, is Blood and Black Lace. <laughs> And then this fucking kill from Orgasmo gets me every time. As fucked up as it is, I think it's hysterical. Okay, my top 10 Jello films of the 1960s. Will we have the same top film? Will you be able to guess what mine is? In ascending order, I'll start with my least favorite. My least favorite Jello film that I covered in the 1960s is So Sweet, So Perverse. I think I might have talked about this little one. It's I'm just not a big fan of it. I've seen it a number of times for the channel. It's kind of a rough one to do because I it's a Le Diabolique type plot. I'm not I'm not crazy about it. Number nine, this might get me some flack and I totally get that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say the girl who knew too much is my ninth favorite. I don't really know what else to say. I I like the movie. I do like the movie. But keep that in mind. I do like these movies. I don't know. Maybe it's just because it, there's a lot of goofy elements that for me feel a little out of place. I mean, I, I like them too. It's just the movie almost kind of feels like it has an identity issue. But again, I still love it. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. Number eight. And if I didn't get flack for that last one, I might get flack for this one. As much as I've talked about it, my A favorite is Perversion Story. Again, how can I rank it as thus and get and say it's got like the best script? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I marvel at the script, but I'm not crazy also about just like Jello movies that just throw sex at you and throw nudity at you. Um, I don't really have any negative things to say about the movie, honestly. There's just movies that I like better. Number seven is Double Face. Some people don't like this movie. I've seen, I saw a lot of reviews of people saying that they thought it was really boring. I really like it and I really like Klaus Kinski. So for me, it was, uh, it's engaging to follow him as he, you know, as he's trying to solve this mystery. I, I like it. Number six, I rank Death Laid an Egg. This is such an out there movie. This is uh, one of the most original Giallo type movies in, in the canon from all the movies I've seen. It's like, yeah, no, that one is different. I have told friends they should check it out. Friends that I know are fans of the French New Wave and fans of Jean-Luc Godard. Um, I saw a review someone had said that if, he, if Godard made a Giallo, it would be this film. And Giulio Kesti is really 
one of those kind of auteur directors and so it just makes sense i really like it there's there's a lot about the movie that i that i wish was a little handled differently again i just have certain tastes with these movies certain things i want to see so that's that's in a nutshell my opinion but I love John louis Trintignant in this movie. I love Ava Olin in this movie. Uh, I think they have some of the best chemistry for, I shouldn't say a couple because they're not, but uh, just for a pair, they have some of the best chemistry. And the scenes with them together, this is going to sound crazy, but it, they remind me of, this is like a jello version of Piero Le Fou. When I watch their scenes together, that's the movie that jumps out at me. Number five is... Orgasmo. This is this is a this is a really good movie. It has its moments of kind of feeling like it's dragging. It also gets kind of obnoxious that Carol Baker's character is just putting up with all this shit and doesn't doesn't acknowledge that these people are clearly taking advantage of her and she like doesn't really do a lot in the way of stopping them or getting help. But she tries to. She tries to at a few points, but um not really hard enough, it seems. Um, but all in all, I, I, do, I obviously I really like this movie. I feel it is a very well written script. I feel like the twists and turns are good. The ending is bonkers as hell, and not in like a far fetched way. It's just like wow. Like I think the ending is so satisfying. It's unfortunate when a movie has a great ending and it doesn't live up to it. If a movie has is just kind of whatever and it has a great ending you remember the last thing you see more so than the first thing you see. So I think Orgasmo has like easily one of the greatest endings, especially in the 1960s. Number four from my favorite Jello films for the 1960s is Libido. So I guess this is, um, how should I put this? This is something I need to talk about. I mentioned that I'm not a big fan of the movies that feel like they're kind of copying Le Diabolique. This is my favorite one that is. It's an Ernesto Gastaldi script, so it probably is. This is my favorite one. This one, I genuinely did not know what was going on or what direction it would go. They set it up that the character is, is kind of crazy and his father was was crazy. This is um, this is very much where you get that bleed over into. It's kind of like Lady Abolik. It's kind of like um, it's kind of it, it's a psychological thriller giallo. There's little dashes of of sexy giallo in there. There's dashes of gothic. I mean, there's actually more. Uh, for gothic i mean there's a lot of elements in there like uh he's not sure if he's seeing the ghost of his father uh the castle in general or the estate i should say i don't know if it's actually really a castle but it feels like one it gives off the very similar vibes libido is a great film libido is a great uh, libido is a is a i feel like is a movie that you could actually get someone to watch regardless of the fact that it is a jello film that's how good that movie is number three for me Part of me wants to rank it higher, but I can't. It's just, it's just not a full-fledged film is the telephone. I really like this. I think, um, you know, there's a whole thing with, with storytelling in general, but it carries over more so into things like comedy and horror is that if you got something to say, you got something, a story to tell, get in and get out. Don't waste our time because you waste our time in any of those genres. Um, it stops becoming funny. Uh, it stops becoming scary. The Telephone is just such a great script, such a great execution of the script. The fact that I didn't write it, I would still adapt it for the stage. It seems to me, it seems like if I was putting up a production of Wait Until Dark, I would want to open with a short of the telephone for the audience. It's you could put them in like the same setting and just, you know, swap out a few things and it would be a nice pre-show. I think it's a great script. Again, it's. I I can't say that I wish it was longer because I feel like it would lose its um its bite if it was longer. It it stays just as long as it needs to and it's very effective. Okay, two left. Um this is probably where I am going to get the most flack if I haven't gotten any. Even if I've already gotten some, I'm probably about to take some more. Keep in mind, keep in mind. The movie I'm going to rank second I recognize as is probably the best Jello of the 1960s. It's just not my favorite. And that movie is Blood and Black Lace. I know. 
this is a great film. This is probably easily the greatest Giallo of the 1960s. It's one of the greatest horror movies of the 1960s. If someone, if you haven't seen this movie, this should be up in the, this should be near the top of your to-do list for, of your watch list for Giallo movies you need to watch if you haven't seen them yet. Blood and Black Lace is a great story. It's a great mystery. There's so many red herrings. Um, this is Baba at his best. The things he sets up in this movie, he 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 brings back in Five Dolls for an August Moon and brings back again in Bay of Blood. It's it's just a great movie. There's not a lot of bad things I really could say about the movie. I just remember the first time I watched it. I I think the first time I saw it, I might have felt a little underwhelmed. But like I say, a lot of that has to do with the first Jello I saw was Deep Red and most people consider that the best one and so if you start with the best one and then you watch the other ones that are great they just don't feel as on the level there's been a lot of time now i've seen way more movies i can kind of easily amend that um and now i i definitely do believe that blood and black lays is much higher in my regard for it than it was when i'd first seen it um it's an important film for jello it is a great movie. It's another one of those movies that you could probably put on and show some people without having to drag them down the rabbit hole that is Giallo Cinema. It's just not my favorite for the 1960s, but it's almost. My favorite Giallo film for the 1960s is The Possessed. I really love this film. Um, whether I would say this is my like in my top five Giallo films of all time, maybe. Maybe. I, I do feel like the movies do get better once you get into the 70s. I, I could probably say this is my top five, definitely. I will say that I believe... So it's written by Julio Casti, who I already said is like write some out there stuff when it comes to these movies. It's also was directed by Luigi Bazzoni. And I've talked to... Every time he comes up, I always have to mention that I think he's probably the most underrated director in this genre. He made three films, three Giallo films, all of them I think are amazing in their own right. The only one that really gets proper attention is The Fifth Chord. The Possessed does a little bit too, but um, for different reasons, but The Fifth Chord is probably the one that more people are familiar with because it came out right, like just during the golden age of Giallo films. Footprints, Le Orma, Footprints on the Moon, however you want to call it, is as much of a slow burn as that movie can be. If you've already seen 25, 30 Giallo films, it doesn't seem as slow. It's just, again, when you're coming off the heels of Bird of the Crystal Plumage, Torso, Deep Red, Blood and Black Lace, all the slasher ones, Footprints on the Moon feels slow as hell but incredible ending. The fifth chord, incredible ending. The only Giallo film that actually has a scene where I'm like scared is the scene with the kid alone at the house. And then The Possessed, again, one of the greatest Giallo films in my, in my opinion. Um, I really connected with the character. And what's great is it's, it's, it feels a bit, it feels like it, it's a very character driven story. And Funny enough, when I was writing about it, the different sources I use, the main source I always use for a lot of my videos is Troy Howard's book, So Deadly, So Perverse. He, he doesn't like Peter Baldwin's performance. He considers it one note and th th he doesn't have any range. You don't see him smiling. You don't see him doing this or that. I disagree. Now, I, I don't disagree with what he says as far as the, like him being accurate. Like, yeah, it's fairly accurate. I think Peter Baldwin is in that character. If you if you're someone who has ever dealt with depression, that's what it feels like that movie. Every, like so many things about that character are so fucking honest that I love it. I think it is probably the best character in Jello, and maybe not. I mean, I'd really have to think about that. I'd really have to go through the '70s. Uh, to really weigh in on like that um, statement, if I'm going to say that, but from where I am, like it, it really, his performance resonates with me. He breaks things off with uh, this, this woman. He tries to rekindle this uh, romance he had with this, this woman, the, the girl who got away kind of thing, you know, really wants to see if there was ever something between them, if they ever could become something more. He's kind of at like a crossroads in life. Um, he's not really getting fulfillment from the career that he's doing, which is writing. He comes to this uh, small town to get away to where he's come to before, where he met this girl and she basically has his heart 
And so he comes back to see if maybe there's more to his life that he can find here. And first thing he finds out is she's, she's dead. And like, what happens? Like, I mean, he doesn't get worse. He does. It's almost like his hope is gone, but he's not going to kill himself. He's not going to go back home. He's going to find out what, what was going on in her life? What was what was happening that led her down this path? And as he investigates, he finds out that there probably was foul play and there probably was murder and like the murder is being covered up. And this becomes his ambition. This becomes his driving force in life. And it's so poignant for this, like this character is so defeated, but he's gonna even like, even despite that, he's gonna find something to fight for, find something to give him passion in life, even though it's ultimately fruitless it's it doesn't matter um he can the best thing he can do is is um bring justice to this person that he loved and the end of the film not you know not a lot of spoilers i mean if you're watching this you probably have seen the movie or at least seen my review of it um is very it's a very bittersweet ending he solves it he solves the mystery but he doesn't really get the the justice isn't served in not in a um, proper legal way, at least, and not in like it's almost like he's too late. And the the last moment of the film, with him overlooking the lake and the divers going in trying to search for a body, and then him just picking up the pieces of his life and leaving, is so powerful. And to me, it's just it's one of those movies that is kind of bleak. And the the point is that's life like life is just like that sometimes and what still resonates for me with this character is that again like for the few days he was in town or i think he was actually there longer i think he was actually there a few weeks because he becomes comatose at some point uh, or he's sick in bed um he found a new meaning in life or i don't know if he found a new meaning in life but um his passion that was gone is was substituted for this purpose and it, you're not really sure if he's able to go back and carry on with his life with a with a newfound vigor for life or a newfound passion it's it seems like that the potential is there or maybe he's just going back and he's continuing in this like this state of his being and the, again that's just kind of depression is that you can do a lot of stuff to fight it but ultimately you're you're just going to be carrying this the rest of your life the possessed i will say yes is my favorite jello film of the 1960s i think it is stylistic as shit i think it is gorgeous that's libido is a close second for the best use of black and white um the possessed is just so goddamn good looking and it looks great in black and white it's like all the shadows the snow it's doing everything right and i wish Batsani had made more giallo films it bothers me that they, we only get those three and they're very different movies which is amazing it's not like they're all uh you know like bava's movies can all be kind of similar or Gento's movies can all be kind of similar uh Fulci's movies can kind of be similar i'd say he actually has a little bit more range somewhat but yes is this the is this the best giallo film of the 1960s maybe not but it's it's up there. Um, again, this is just my favorite. What are your top 10 Jello films from the 1960s? You can, um, if you want, I would like, I really do like seeing feed, feedback from people. And so, and engaging in conversations with uh, what you like, what speaks to you. You can rank your top 10 from the movies that I did from the movies I've covered. You can throw in movies that I never covered um, in a deep dive on the channel. If you want, if you want to talk about uh, sweet body of Deborah or any of the other movies that I just haven't gotten to on, a, on that deeper level, feel free to um, I'm going to wrap this up. Cause uh, I've been talking a lot. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you made it to the end. And um, this is me talking without um, a script. <laughs> So I thank you for watching y'all. I'm at the point at the time of recording this. I've finally, a few hours ago, I broke over a thousand subscribers. I am so happy about that. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. I'm so, I'm so overjoyed. 
thank you so much for this incredible year. If you really want to help me out, consider subscribing to my Patreon. I just started putting more content in there that's Patreon exclusive. As of now, it's just uh, me doing viewings. I'm going to start doing podcasting with a friend talking about Giallo adjacent films. The first thing we're going to talk about is cruising. We've got a lineup of we've got we've easily got like 12 films lined up to talk about that are Giallo adjacent. Uh, we're going to talk about other things too, other segments. This friend may also be joining me for riff tracks for certain movies. You can also follow my personal Instagram if you want. Several of you have. You can also follow The King and Giallo on Instagram. Anyways, thank you. This is Tanner Leeser for The King and Giallo. And if nothing else, I will see you next time. Technology rocks. God, I'm just so, so known, so cultured. <laughs> if only I was not so messy.